Le reste de la euh, euh, matinée de le symposium est euh, dédié au Covid. Euh, on aura deux présentations. La première euh, fait le point actuel par rapport à l'épidémiologie et après on s'occupera un peu des scénarios potentiels euh, euh, à, à la future euh, pour Genève. Alors on commence avec le point de la situation épidémiologique et ça sera la doctoresse Jacquia. Je vous donne la parole. Alors voilà, après euh, avoir parlé d'hypnose, on pourra aborder avec euh, sérénité en fait euh, les chiffres au niveau mondial et peut-être aussi euh, envisager euh, la seconde vague. Donc ici au niveau mondial, vous voyez qu'on a dépassé les 6 millions de cas et on est bientôt à 400 000 décès. Par contre, en termes de cas actifs, on voit que quand même il y a un ralentissement avec moins de cas actifs qu'auparavant et ça c'est vraiment lié à la situation en Europe et aux États-Unis. Les points chauds en Europe... C'est la Russie euh, qui présente presque le double de cas euh, des pays de l'Union européenne. Aux États-Unis, ça reste euh, les États-Unis, mais, mais le Brésil qui présente 500 000 euh, cas actuellement. En, Inde, euh, en Asie, l'Inde qui euh, approche les 200 000 cas. En Afrique, c'est toujours difficile parce qu'on a l'impression que beaucoup de pays n'ont pas la capacité euh, de tester suffisamment. Ici, je vous remontre à gauche ce que je vous avais montré il y a trois semaines, où il y avait une courbe exponentielle du nombre de cas en Amérique du Sud, et vous voyez qu'actuellement, ça a vraiment explosé, où actuellement, et principalement à cause du Brésil et du Pérou, vous avez plus de cas déclarés par jour, donc c'est des moyennes de trois jours, que dans n'importe quelle autre région du monde auparavant. Donc vraiment une situation extrêmement préoccupante en Amérique du Sud. J'aimerais aujourd'hui parler en fait, de l'importance de faire des tests pour mieux comprendre en fait, le nombre de cas euh, détectés. Et si vous voyez un, un graphique qui est assez intéressant, qui compare en fait, le nombre de tests faits par jour au nombre de cas euh, confirmés. Donc, en résumé, euh, si vous détectez euh, un cas et, que, et si vous testez un cas et qu'il est positif, euh, ça vous donne peu de vision de ce qui est en train de se passer en fait, dans votre euh, région. Par contre, si vous testez 100 personnes, il y en a une de positif, vous avez une vision plus fiable de ce qui est en train de se passer parce que vous testez vraiment de manière large. Donc ici, vous voyez euh, différents cas de figure. Vous voyez la Corée qui a testé depuis le début de manière très large, aussi les asymptomatiques qui n'a jamais cessé euh, de tracer ses contacts. Et vous voyez qu'elle a augmenté sa capacité à tester. Donc quand la courbe va vers le haut, la capacité à tester augmente. Quand elle va vers la droite, euh, il y a en fait plus de cas détectés pour le, un nombre stable de, de tests. Et quand elle va vers la gauche, euh, vous voyez qu'il y a un même nombre de tests, mais moins de cas détectés. Donc en fait, la, la Corée a, a bien euh, fonctionné. À un moment donné, elle s'est fait un peu rattraper par l'épidémie. Euh, L'idéal, c'est de toujours être à 10 à 30 cas euh, 10 à 30 tests pour chaque cas détesté. Il faudrait rester sur ces courbes que vous voyez en diagonale, où vous avez x2, x5, x10, x20. Ça veut dire, par exemple, 20 tests donnent un cas détecté, ou x10, 10 tests donnent un cas détecté, et ainsi de suite. Donc la Corée est restée toujours en dessus de 20 tests pour un cas détecté. Par contre, si vous regardez les États-Unis, ils ont commencé à tester très tardivement. En fait, ils n'ont pas publié leur data avant euh, mi-mars. Et puis à ce moment-là, ils ont augmenté clairement leur capacité à tester euh, en restant sur cette ligne de 10 tests pour un cas détecté. Mais vous voyez aussi que l'épidémie s'accroissait euh, considérablement parce qu'ils ont pris l'épidémie un peu plus tard euh, que la Corée. Pour le Brésil, c'est assez catastrophique. Vous voyez que la courbe est à plat vers la droite. Donc, en fait, euh, il y a une saturation du nombre de tests et quasiment chaque test fait euh, correspond à un cas détecté. Donc, certainement, euh, le nombre de cas déjà exponentiels qu'on voit est beaucoup plus euh, important que ce qui est euh, déclaré. La Suisse est comme toujours assez bon élève et suit un peu la courbe de la Corée, mais on a quand même vu une saturation de notre capacité à faire des tests, d'une part par une stratégie assez restrictive à certains moments donnés, mais aussi en termes de limitation du nombre de réactifs et aussi de matériel pour faire les tests. Mais on voit très bien que maintenant, on a clairement une courbe qui retourne vers la gauche, donc une, une capacité à faire des tests qui reste assez constante, mais toujours moins de, de cas détectés. Mais si on regarde au niveau mondial le nombre de tests par cas confirmés sur toute l'épidémie, on voit que quand même c'est la Corée, la, la Corée du Sud qui est le meilleur élève avec quasiment 80, euh, cas pour chaque, euh, 80 tests pour chaque cas détecté et que la Suisse, euh, on est à 13. Donc on pourrait faire beaucoup mieux et c'est très très important de, de le faire maintenant que euh, l'épidémie euh, se ralentit pour pouvoir détecter euh, les clusters. 
Donc c'est pour ça que je vous ai parlé euh, de ces graphiques, de, de l'importance de regarder les tests pour comprendre les cas détectés. C'est pour justement maintenant euh, comment on va détecter les, les deuxièmes vagues. C'est certainement en regardant les pays qui sont capables de continuer à tester à grande échelle, comme par exemple la Corée du Sud, où vous voyez que... Euh, ici, euh, la courbe est repartie vers la droite avec une réaugmentation de la capacité à faire des tests et aussi euh, le nombre de cas détectés et qui se traduit sur la droite euh, en forme logarithmique euh, par une augmentation euh, du nombre de cas. Donc, euh, dans un pays comme ça, on a l'impression qu'ils ont toujours une bonne vision de ce qui est en train de se passer parce qu'en fait, ils testent vraiment très large. Donc, on, on a l'impression qu'ils ne sont pas en train de rater euh, trop euh, euh, d'infections, même si on sait que de toute façon, le nombre de cas déclarés est bien en dessous euh, euh, du nombre d'infections réelles. Alors, en Corée du Sud, ils ont assez rapidement réagi. Si vous regardez dans la semaine du 25 au 29, ils ont euh, trouvé trois clusters, un lié à une compagnie d'achat en ligne, euh, deux autres liés à des événements religieux. Il y avait déjà eu plusieurs clusters euh, les semaines précédentes liés à des événements religieux. Ils ont assez rapidement ciblé euh, des mesures restrictives euh, par rapport à, à ces événements pour pouvoir essayer de contrôler l'épidémie. Sur la droite, euh, vous voyez euh, en dessous la situation euh, ici, en fait, à dégoût au début euh, de l'épidémie en Corée, qui, qui, où il y avait jusqu'à presque 600 cas par jour. Donc maintenant, ce n'est pas du tout à la même échelle. Vous voyez ici, effectivement, qu'il y a une augmentation de cas dans ces clusters, jusqu'à 20 cas. Euh, Gyeonggi, c'est assez proche de Séoul, euh, mais ça reste des petits clusters. Et grâce à cette capacité qu'ils ont de tester de manière extrêmement large, il y a une identification de ces clusters et puis euh, une prévention de transmission. Donc les points à retenir, c'est que c'est très important de, de, de connaître le nombre de, taille, de tests effectués dans un pays pour comprendre le nombre de cas détectés dans ce pays, que tester, c'est hyper important pour l'identification des clusters. Ensuite, il faut isoler les cas et tracer les contacts. Et c'est particulièrement important au début, mais aussi en fin d'épidémie. La carte ci-dessous vous montre les pays en vert qui testent suffisamment. Et vous voyez que la Suisse est en vert, donc on doit rester dans le vert. Et puis voilà, c'était le dernier. Merci pour votre attention. Bon, alors voilà le vue global. Euh, on fait encore maintenant le zoom vers la situation euh, ici à Genève. Et le docteur Estelle essaie de prévoir un petit peu l'avenir, les scénarios éventuels ici euh, à Genève, dans la région de Genève. OK, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jan Estil and I will talk um, a little bit about how to use mathematical modeling to predict, to make predictions, to make projections about the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic. And I will show also some examples of our own work uh, focusing on here in Geneva. And I would like to just start by declaring that I have no conflicts of interest and that our, work, our group is supported by the Swiss National Science Foundation. So let's start about thinking about what a mathematical model actually means and why are they useful in infectious disease epidemiology. We know that the true world is unfortunately to a large extent unknown to us. We don't really know what is happening in the world. We don't know how the mechanisms behind infectious disease transmission really work. So the only thing we can do is make observations. We can see what, what we, we can see that is happening and we also have some prior knowledge from previous diseases, for example, how viral diseases transmit. But once with the observations and the existing knowledge, we can then little by little think about theories, try to formulate how, for example, diseases spread between in the community, and these theories are what I will call, I call here mathematical models. So kind of in terms of, in mathematical language, in mathematical equations, we try to explain how diseases spread in population. So it's not about statistical models this time. Statistical models try to explain or interpret the data that we have but these kind of infectious disease mathematical models aim to kind of understand the underlying mechanisms of transmission and how. And then, based on this, we can make also simulations of future scenarios. So we can, when we have a model that we are happy about, we can see that it reproduces the past 
uh, well enough, we can also use it to make predictions into the future. And then hopefully, of course, make good decision, decisions based on these models which help to, to also change the real world. There are many different kinds of mathematical models that are used to uh, project infectious diseases. I will just show as an example the model that we are working on at the moment. This kind of model is called a compartmental model, which essentially means that we represent the, po the population of a certain setting, for example in, the, in Geneva, by a set of uh, compartments. And so that each compartment basically represents one group of people. It just tells the size of this group of people, how many uh, and uh, kind of models this across the time. So the model that we have is an adaptation of the, of the widely used SEIR model. The S for susceptible, E for exp exposed, I for infectious and R for recovered. With, uh, where we've also added a few compartments to make it more, uh, more accurate. But basically the idea is that we have here 12 compartments that represent the epidemiological state from the people are first susceptible, they then get infected, so they first uh, go to this E group, exposed, and then go through the inf different stages of the infection until either recovery or death. So we are, have here 12 epidemiological states, but we also have divide our population in our model into three age groups at the moment. We can, of course, uh, also include more age groups, but this is the situation at the moment. So we have children, adults, and seniors. So it, in total, we have three times 12, that is 36 compartments. So what the model basically does, it tracks across the time how the sizes of these 36 compartments evolve. And the model is solved by finding the parameters for these flows here, so that to represent how the people flow from one compartment to another. Of course, the most, probably the most important um, flow in the model for the dynamics of the epidemic is the infection itself. So I will show a little bit more detail how this happens in the model. So we know that the risk of getting infected per day can roughly be estimated from three factors. So one is the risk of getting infected, the risk per contact. Another factor is the number of contacts between people with other people in a day. And the third factor is the proportion of people who are among the contacts who are infectious. And as I mentioned, we have our model is age structured, so we have three age groups, and we know that the contacts between and within these age groups are not homogeneous. So what we've tried to do is try to estimate the uh, intensity of contacts between and within all these three age groups. We've done this by, by reviewing the data. Uh, this is based on, uh, on analysis from a few of our neighboring countries. And you should interpret these. These, are not, these don't attempt to give any absolute number of contacts, but these, these are just relative contacts, meaning that basically, for example, children are twice as likely to have contacts with other children than adults are with other adults. However, of course, the qu big question is what is a contact? And this we, we don't really know in terms of the disease transmission. Of course, this is a new disease. We don't know exactly the, the roots of transmission, but even so, even if we did, whenever it's something airborne, for example, it's not that easy to really say what is a contact. So we just have to, in our model, simplify the situation so that by contacts we just mean any kind of contacts 
where transmission would be possible if the other individual was infectious. So we just assume that the intensity of contact between the different age groups more or less is also applicable for the transmission supporting contacts. So the next step when we have our model structure is to parameterize it and calibrate it. As you, we saw in the previous graph, there are plenty of, each model has dozens of parameters that we have to estimate as accurately as possible. And of course, this is not a very easy task and this is the most complicated task of, of developing models. So we have for most of the parameters some knowledge from the previous uh, research. So for, for each model we can kind of estimate some plausible range where, where this parameter would be. And this depends on the type of parameter we're talking about. We know that, for example, natural disease progression, like for example the incubation period, should not that much differ between different settings. So we can use the data that we have uh, from the last few months to try to estimate it and get a quite a narrow a range for this parameter, whereas some, like for example the contact networks and the intensity of the contacts and the infectiousness can depend a lot on the, on the setting. So we can't take these parameters directly from studies from, from China or from other settings even in Europe, so we should... So here we just have much less prior knowledge, so we have a much wider, wider range or for these parameters. But what we can do then is, when we have these ranges, calibrate the model into against the observations to find the best set of parameter values. So what this just means is, is that, for example, here we have the daily COVID-related deaths in, in Geneva, and we try to model, run the model with different parameterizations to try to find curves that fit these data as well as possible. There are different algorithms to do this. I will not go into detail into this. Of course, it can never be exactly accurate. We have to make compromises. We have different indicators like deaths, hospitalizations, etc. But try to find the best fit to the available data. And these used in these parameters. And before showing uh, uh, the briefly the results, I will just quickly distinguish between what we, what I now call predictions and scenarios. So we can use models to make short-term projections, which we can call predictions. That is to say, what will happen in the next few days, for example, in, or in the next week. So we can make a model which is very accurately calibrated to the data to the data even for the latest days and try to get, get a best estimate how these different indicators will develop in the coming days. And these kind of predictions are of course useful for, for example, in the context of hospitals to plan how many patients uh, approximately we expect to have in the next few days or also to make rapid policy decisions like for example when should we pull the brake, when should we reintroduce some preventive measures. Whereas the results I will now show are not really predictions, they're more like scenarios, they go to much, they have a much broader time period, months or years. We can of course basically run the model as for as long time as we want. Another question is how accurate such predictions would be but then we can get a range of plausible of scenarios for the future, ranging from the worst to the best case. And the key thing here is, of course, to understand what are the factors that influence which of these scenarios will be then more likely. And these kind of scenarios can then be used for, for example, long-term policy, policy decisions. But I'm here just showing now six graphs from uh, February until the end of this year, from Geneva, about these are the daily new infections. We can in each graph here see that here's one peak here, which is about 
the goes to maximum of 2,000 per day. Of course, this is not confirmed cases. We already have data from the zero prevalence survey showing that there could be something like 10 times more new infections than there were actually confirmed cases. But these are, of course, outputs of the model. So, so that's how we can also show the actual new infections. But then what happens after May or in June then dif differs according to the assumptions that we make in the model. The first here, the first graph here is of course the horror scenario where we assume that everything goes back to normal how life was in February. We ignore the virus completely and this is not only our model, this is what every model would predict that there was a huge increase in the new infections which would then result in tens of th or thousands of people being infected. Whereas then the next graph here is the opposite. This is the best case scenario, but this we achieved by reducing all contacts basically starting in, in May by 80%. So regardless of the relaxations that we have in the that we are now lifting these, poly these strong restrictions, we would still be able to prevent basically 80% of all transmissions. Reduction in contacts doesn't mean reducing physical contacts necessarily. It can be also done by other measures like tr uh, intensive tracing and testing. But then we have also a range of other scenarios. For example, here we see that with a with, uh, milder reduction, 45%, we could keep the epidemic quite well under control. There would be still, it would not eradicate, we would still expect a slowly increasing number of new cases when in the autumn here until the end of the year. But then in this graph here, what we did was we assumed that this reduction only applies to adults and seniors, showing that really every age group is important. So if we let one age group or one population, any population group go to back to the real normal, then we can see a much, much more severe increase in the next coming weeks or, or months. We also modeled here a scenario where we focused on the seniors. We tried to minimize the contact between seniors and other age groups where there was whereas the other contacts were reduced much milder. And then finally here, a kind of start-stop strategy which shows that if the hospitalizations cross a certain limit, we reintroduce the lockdown. But this is just ongoing work, so we are continuously working on the models, and this is one, like in science in general, we know that uh, Whenever new knowledge becomes available, which in the case of COVID, of course, happens very rapidly all the time, we get new data, we can improve our models and make better predictions. And we're trying also to model the, to apply our model, of course, with to other settings and with more detail. We've used it now for Geneva, for, for the whole Switzerland, but also, and also, of course, to improve the model itself, to include more age groups, to, inc to make more sensitivity analysis, to see if our structure is really reliable, and also to focus all more on the short-term predictions, because so far the work has been mainly focusing on the long-term predictions. And our group is also working on another kind of model, a network model, which includes more detailed, in more detailed way, how the people really contact each other. So without this, in these compartmental models, the, we assume a very kind of homogeneous mixing so that the whole population is in contact with each other, which of course is not really true. So as conclusions, mathematical models are often the only way that we can really make predictions that go into the future. So try to first understand how the disease works, how the transmission works, and then use this information to extrapolate from the current knowledge into the future. It's just important to understand that the model always re reflects what's put into the model. So if we 
parameterize it badly, we will get, get results, but the results are also likely to be wrong. But if we, are, if we try to, if we have a good model, it doesn't have to be perfect, it cannot be perfect, it can provide something that is helpful for us. And of course, this also means that different models can provide different results. It doesn't mean that one model is more correct than the other one, but we have to try to understand the differences, really, what causes these differences. And of course, the main question, how will COVID epidemic develop in the coming months? As any model was, would say, I, I should also say that we can't know this. It depends on how the people will behave. It depends on what, how well these new measures like contact tracing will work. But what we can see from the models is that still some efforts are needed and they should also cover all the population groups. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank all my colleagues. Mm -hmm.